This, I think, is the fifth of the introductory course lectures, and this particular one is about our daily practice called Gongyo. So uh, I hope those who are already doing Gongyo will get some understanding and inspiration from what I'm going to say, and those who have never done Gongyo uh, will get anyway some idea of the purpose in our doing what sounds to be something very difficult indeed, but actually, uh, once you've got into the rhythm of it, becomes uh, a joy. So really, I think learning gongyo is rather like learning to ride a bicycle. To begin with, you teeter about and find it very difficult. Uh, but suddenly, everything seems to click into place, if you really persevere. So if you're struggling to learn gongyo now, or if you're looking at the gongyo book and thinking, how am I ever going to learn it? Or if you're thinking, gosh, I don't I think I can ever do this practice of Buddhism if I've got to learn a thing like that. What I promise you is what has happened to everyone else and everyone else can promise you is that you really do pe reach a point after perhaps two months of doing it slowly and steadily, suddenly something seems to just click in your life and you find yourself in rhythm, exactly like learning to ride a bicycle. So really, Gongyo, I think myself, and I guess anyone who's tried it and is doing it, is an incredibly powerful form of prayer. And the purpose of my talk this evening is to explain I start by why that is so. saying uh, something about what Nichiren Daishonin said concerning practice to the Gohonzon. And this is a, a, a quotation from a Gosho called Reply to Lady Nichinyo. And it reads as follows. Never seek this Gohonzon outside yourself. The Gohonzon exists within the mortal flesh of us ordinary people who embrace the Lotus Sutra and chant nam myo ho kyo to be endowed with the ten worlds means that all the ten worlds, without exception, are contained in the one world of Buddhahood. Only with faith can one enter Buddhahood. So faith in Buddhism is action. That is to say, action to practice exactly as the Buddha taught. And the practice of Gongyo is exactly as the Buddha taught us to do. So if we do Gongyo, day in, day out, we will, combined with the other two practice, practices of teaching others and study, we will, in this t lifetime, attain Buddhahood. The very practice of Gongyo is to open gradually the doors to your Buddha state. Now, when Nichiren Daishon said at the beginning, never seek this Gohonzon outside yourself, the Gohonzon exists within the mortal flesh of us ordinary people who embrace the Lotus Sutra and chant nam myoho kyo He means that when you practice to the Gohonzon, which you've already had a lecture about, what you're in fact doing is entering it, or if you like, fusing your life with it, or, in other words, you are realizing that your life is the Gohonzon. And that the Gohonzon that was inscribed by Nichiren Daishonin is a mirror of your life itself. So this purpose, the purpose of this practice called Gongyo, is, as it were, to enter the Gohonzon. Over months and years of doing it, you gradually open the doors of your life and realize that you also, just as the Buddha promised, possess the Buddha state, the highest state of human life. So, in achieving this state, of course we have to purify our life and put it in balance and rhythm. So, Looking at it from perhaps a shallower point of view, the purpose of our daily gongyo, our daily practice, is to put our life in perfect balance and rhythm, to purify it, in other words. Sometimes people say, 
practicing gongyo is like digging a pipeline down through your life to its depths where the Buddha state lies. When you're learning gongyo, perhaps a little bit painfully struggling with it every day, and allowing precious time in order to learn it, you're digging that pipeline down gradually through all the layers of your life until finally you hit the Buddha state. Once you do that, of course, it's then necessary to keep the pipeline open. And that is what the daily practice is all about, to purify your life every day so that the pipeline to Buddhahood is pure and clean and the great qualities of Buddhahood which are compassion, and wisdom, life force and courage and so on, can actually flow freely and cleanly through your life. And then, of course, having done that practice of gongyo, you then carry out the fundamental practice of this teaching, which is to chant nam myoho renge kyo over and over again. In other words, by the time you are chanting nam myoho renge kyo, your life is perfectly in balance, perfectly purified. And therefore, your great prayers, as you chant Daimoku, will propel themselves outwards and inwards with maximum effect. So, the Gyo of Gongyo means practice. Gyo, G-Y-O. And the Gon of Gongyo, G-O-N, means assiduous, or it could mean eager, or endeavouring strongly, striving hard. All those things can be meant by the character that's pronounced gong. So in other words, gong yo is assiduous practice, or practice involving strong endeavour, or eager and enthusiastic practice. So in a way you could say gongyo means let's go. So gongyo like and its formula is entirely based on the law of cause and effect, which we've also discussed in a number of lectures before. Through that great effort to do this assiduous practice, your determination to do it well, you are making an incredibly pure cause which will bring an incredibly pure effect or benefit into your life. So as you know, cause and effect are exactly related to each other. You do something great and something great will occur in return to you. You do something destructive and something destructive will occur to you. So gongyo is very, a very pure cause to make. You give up your time. Maybe you have to get up half an hour earlier in the morning to do it. That takes effort. But it brings incredible reward. So of course nothing is free, is it, in this life. We have to work for everything. If one's going to win a race or play golf well or tennis or be uh, an expert at any particular field of science or the arts, you have to work at it. If you want to attain the highest state of human life and be happy, then you have to work for it. And that work is... So how did this gong all begin? Yesterday. You know, how was this uh, practice of gongyo conjured up in the wisdom of the Buddha? Well, it started, of course, with Nichiren Daishonin himself. Nichiren Daishonin said that we should, first of all, read, recite, and chant two chapters of the Lotus Sutra, which were the key chapters in which the meaning of the whole of that sutra was contained. They are the Hoben chapter and the Juryo chapter, part of which, and only part of which, we recite in Gongyo. These were the key words, in other words, of the Lotus Sutra. Vanishin Daishonin said, if you recite the Hoban and Juryo chapter, 
It's as if you are reciting all 28 chapters of the Lotus Sutra, because the meaning is all contained in those two. And since the Lotus Sutra embraces all the other sutras that have ever been taught in Buddhism, all 80,000 of them, to recite the Hoban and Jurio chapters of the Lotus Sutra is to recite all the sutras of all the Buddhas. So to recite those two chapters is embracing in your life all the teachings of all the Buddhas since time began. The other thing which Nishin Daishonin said was the basic practice of chanting nam myoho renge kyo over and over again to your heart's content, he said. And I'll talk about those words, to your heart's content, a bit later. So with these two guidelines from Nichiren Daishonin, uh, round about the 13th or the 14th century, no one exactly knows the date, uh, the high priest of Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism decided to uh, establish a firm practice of gongyo which the priests at the head temple would carry out daily. And this involved moving in procession from temple to temple within the precincts of the head temple itself and reciting the various prayers of Gongya. So each of those prayers was carried out at a different temple. After they'd completed one prayer, they would move to the next temple to complete the next one. And of course, each temple had some uh, significant relationship with the prayer itself. So that is how Gongyo began, conducted only by the priests. The lay people didn't do Gongyo. In those days, in the early days of Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism, the action was entirely left to the priests. And the lay people's task was to support the priests. So certainly the lay people would chant nam myoho renge kyo and sometimes they might recite the sutra because they knew Nichiren Daishonin said they should but there was no, as it were, formal practice that had been devised in the wisdom of the high priests carried out by the lay people. And it wasn't in fact until after World War II when was religion was freed or liberated in Japan and people were permitted to practice as they please that the president of the lay society, whose name was Toda, Mr. Toda, asked the permission of the high priest for the lay people to now actually practice Gongyo themselves in the same way exactly as the priests. And the reason for that is, of course, that a new phase of the great movement for world peace or Kosen Rufu, began at that time. And the lay people's responsibility became extremely important. Therefore, of course, they needed the life force and the wisdom and the compassion so now, to carry out So now, a bit about the movement. form of Gongyo. For those of you who have not yet done it or know little about it, it really consists of three sections. The first section, you chant or recite the sutras the two chapters that I mentioned. And in the second section, you make silent prayer, and in the third section, you chant Daimoku. That is, say, you chant nam myoho renge -kyo. So, in the morning, you do four different prayers, and then finally, you do the chanting, and then conclude. So there are three distinct parts of the practice. Reciting the sutra, saying the silent prayer, and actually chanting nam myoho renge so the purpose And I'll explain the reason to purify your, your, your life. What is it that you're actually purifying? The answer to that is that you are overcoming in the process of that practice the negativity that exists in your life inherently in every single one of us and transforming that into a positive force for value. So you're overcoming in that process desires that are purely shallow and selfish and broadening and widening your life into desires which have 
value and which are creative for good both in your own life and in other people's lives. So you can really feel this, those who've done Gongyo, you can really feel this purification. Somehow the world does look brighter when you've completed Gongyo. I remember thinking that the first time that I've ever noticed how beautiful trees are in winter was after I'd really learned to do Gongyo properly. I'd never noticed it before, but my senses were so pure. So everything is purified, and all that negativity, that destructive quality, which causes us so much trouble in life, is cleared in the process of that Gongyo. Now this is why, of course, we do it twice a day. So you do Gongyo in the morning when you get up. Through the night, your life has become very jumbled. During sleep, you dream, you have maybe nightmares, whatever happens. One's life is always in a bit of a jumble when you wake up in the morning. Sometimes people have the most negative of their thoughts when they're shaving or if you're not shaving, when you're making your first cup of tea or coffee. So after that jumble which has occurred while you're sleeping, you need to purify your life again and get it into balance. It's true, isn't it? We can really feel off balance when we get out of bed and get up in the morning. The purpose of Gongyo is to put your life straight away in balance. And in the evening, we've come back home maybe from a day's work. There have been many problems, difficulties, obstacles, people getting angry and irritated all around one, the rush and the pressure of daily life. We need to put our life into balance again in order to spend an enjoyable, valuable, constructive sort of evening and go to sleep happily. So at that point perhaps I should have mentioned it's evening gongyo, not good night gongyo. It should be done in the evening while one's still reasonably fresh. If one does it just before one goes to bed, then you're droopy and tired and really all you feel like is getting into bed and going to sleep. So it is an evening practice, normally conducted, but depending on people's work or daily timetable, normally done between about four o'clock and about eight or nine in the evening. So I've talked about this fresh. purification. What, what is that process is the next point I'm sure you're thinking in your head. What am I digging this pipeline down through? And without going into a lot of detail, because it could be a lecture on its own, I think I'd better explain at this point that Buddhism teaches that we have nine consciousnesses. Nine consciousnesses it, misses it is, which you have to go through in order to reach the ninth, which is the state or the consciousness of Buddha. So the first five are very simple. They're one's ordinary senses of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, and so on. The sixth consciousness, consciousness is your thinking mind. Any psychiatrist will agree with this so far. The seventh consciousness is the first layer of your subconscious and that is the era, area of your desires, your ego in other words. Of course Buddhism, Nichiren Buddhism teaches the importance of desires. Some religions try to deny desire but Buddhism points out that desire is an inevitable part of life and what is more is an important part of life because it's a driving force. Therefore, Nichiren Buddhism follows the principle of turning desires into enlightenment. Through your great effort to fulfill your desires, you chant nam myoho renge -kyo, which in its turn is so strong a force that inevitably it brings you into the Buddha state. So even if your desires are wrongly directed in a way that could harm you or others, they'll be turned in the process of chanting to a positive and valuable direction. So those desires arise out of the seventh consciousness. And the eighth consciousness is a vast area. Often it's been said that the subconscious 
uh, and the conscious areas of one's life are like the tip of an iceberg to the huge area under the water. The subconscious is enormous. So the eighth subconscious, or as some psychiatrists call it, the, in psycholo uh, psychology, the collective subconscious, is the area where all your experiences of all your whole eternal life are stored. If at one time the entity that is you went through the stage of swimming in the sea and then developing little legs and crawling out onto the mud and eventually creating or evolving some sort of a body that could withstand life on land, all those memories are there. The memory of your babyhood, the memory when you were in your mother's womb, everything is stored in that amazing area of the eighth consciousness. So you can understand, therefore, that that is the area where your karma or destiny is stored. All the effects of all the causes that you've ever made in your eternal life are contained in the huge sea of the Eighth Consciousness. So, this is very much a shared consciousness. Of course, there are many other people who have shared many of those experiences as you have. So you could say it is the shared consciousness of the entire human race and beyond that which is contained in that area. So it's no wonder our dreams are such a jumble. We're drawing in our dreams on that eighth consciousness, memories and things that have happened to us in the remotest past as well as in the near past. And then finally, deep below that lies the ninth consciousness, which is the universal consciousness, the consciousness that is shared with everything in the whole universe the Buddha consciousness, the universe that exists in us, in our oneness with the universe, the great universe itself, is the ninth consciousness. So that is called, uh, in one Japanese principle, Amala Shiki, the fundamental pure sense. The fundamental pure sense or the purifying force of life, or the essence of life, the pure essence of life, shared by every living thing, or Namyoho Renge Kyo, the greater self, whereas the seventh consciousness, the area of the ego, is the lesser self. So unless we understand and can tap this ninth consciousness, you can see that inevitably human life is at the mercy of the seventh and the eighth consciousnesses. So of course, uh, those who understand psychology and are experts in it realize that. They're fully aware of the seventh and the eighth consciousnesses and the way it affects our lives. But up to the present time, they're not aware of the ninth. So the purpose of Buddhism is to plumb the depths of your life to the ninth consciousness so that all that radiates from that will then filter through the seventh and eighth consciousness, purifying it on the way and lead you to carry out thoughts, words and deeds which are valuable and harmonious. So, in a very theoretical way, that again is what is happening when you do gongyo. So, it's quite often you find that when you begin to do gongyo, you feel uncomfortable. You fidget, maybe you scratch your head, maybe even you feel a bit irritable, angry, or whatever. That's quite reasonable, because you're at that point pushing your way down through the senses, the first to the fifth, to the sixth, and then to the seventh and eighth consciousness. But after a bit, 
your concentration seems to improve. You seem to really be totally absorbed by this gongya. By uh, then, your inner state is revealed in gongya and continues to be revealed throughout your chanting of Namyo Horengikyo. Of course, when you get up and go outside and find you've got to queue for 20 minutes for the bus, you may rapidly find yourself leaving the Buddha state and going into some other state of life. But the fact is that the more you practice, the more that will not happen. The longer will you stay in the Buddha state throughout the day. And your actions will reveal that to you. So Gongyo is a daily battle. A daily battle with the negative and destructive forces that are absolutely inherent in every single person's human life. A battle against the lower worlds of those ten worlds that we explained in the first lecture of this course. A struggle to turn everything in one's life from negative to positive value. For this reason, you can understand that Gongyo mustn't be too easy, must it? Neither, of course, must it, be, must it be too difficult, because we've all got normal daily lives to lead. So Gongyo must be difficult enough to cause us to make effort. Unless we make effort, we're not going to defeat that negative force which is so strong in our lives. Yet, it's got to be easy enough for us to fit into our daily program. So I really think it's an amazing practice in this sense, because you can fit it in, if you really have a mind to do so. When I first started to uh, be introduced to this Buddhism, I didn't think it was possible for me to do Gongya. Not because I didn't think I could do it, but because I thought I was such a busy uh, businessman that I couldn't possibly find the time in my incredible schedule to do gongyo twice a day and chant daimoku and all the rest of it. And then one person who practiced for a long time said to me, well, I understand your feelings, Mr. Corson, but uh, please remember that the practice of gongyo and chanting daimoku activates your wisdom. So you'll find you're using your time more wisely. And it really proved to be true. Of course I managed to fit in Gongyo and Daimoku and I did, it seemed to me, sometimes twice as much in the day in my business life as I'd been able to do previously because I didn't waste time so much and I used every minute valuably, more and more that I practiced. So Gongyo, uh, for those of you who feel, oh gosh, you know, this is, have I really got to do this every day? It's meant to be difficult. If it wasn't a little bit difficult, it would be useless. Because it is an effort to change one's life from negative to positive. And furthermore, the more you get used to doing it, the more you begin to see what you've got to change before you even start going. As you begin, as you go up and get ready to start it, you become so aware of yourself my gosh, you're an irritable so-and-so this morning. Or, oh, you're so lethargic today, you know. Right, by the end of this gongyo, that's got to change. That is the attitude, and it'll change. So gongyo, let's so go, now, is a I'd really like good translation. for a bit about reciting the sutra. This is not prayer. Reciting the sutra is practice. It's an exercise. We are always taught to recite it rhythmically, to pronounce each syllable carefully and clearly, to be firm and vigorous as we do it. This is the exercise by which you begin to purify your life. If you slur it, or you speak it in a slovenly way, if you're not alert, then, of course, the effect will be that much less. So, of course, the sutra has deep meaning. And it's very important it should have a deep meaning, otherwise you get fed up to the back teeth doing it after a couple of years. But the very fact that it takes you 
many, many, many years to understand every line of those chapters of the Lotus Sutra mean that you can never become bored with what you're saying. Of course, it's also significant that what you're saying is in fact the very, uh, in, a, in a brief way, the whole of Buddhist teaching. So of course it has immense meaning from that point of view. And of course you can keep your interest in it always by trying to understand more and more what those words mean. But in fact, even if you don't understand one single word of what it means, it still has effect because it's an exercise. The exercise of practicing rhythmically, clearly and strongly. So really this reciting of the sutra is leading up towards your silent prayers and your chanting of Namyo Harengekyo, purifying your life on the way. Someone said it's like the run before you actually leap over the high jump. You have to run, make more and more effort, then you achieve your victory and go over the top. So in, in a way it's similar. the words of uh, the Jurio chapter, the, the second of the two chapters that you recite, it says, Ishin Yokken Butsu, Fuji Shakushimyo. Ishin Yokken Butsu, Fuji Shakushimyo. So those words mean, in my great desire to see the Buddha appear in my life, I do not begrudge it in the least. In my great desire to see the Buddha appear in my life, I do not begrudge it in the least. Really, that is the spirit of Gongya. In one's desire to advance and open up and develop the highest state of one's life, you don't begrudge the time it takes to do Gongya. And you put your utmost into it. Really, those words express the spirit of Gongya. Ishin Yoken Butsu. Fuji Shakushimyo. So the Hoben chapter, which is the first chapter you recite, is really the theory of the mechanics of life and of the existence of the state of Buddha in it, in every human life. And the Juryo chapter is Shakyamuni Buddha's own experience of Buddhahood of the eternity of life and of Buddhahood. So, strictly speaking, you could say that the fact that we recite the Hoban chapter is expressing our praise of the Buddha's wisdom and of our expectation of revealing the same wisdom in ourselves. And reciting the Juryo chapter is again praise for all that we've learned through the Buddha's experience, through first Shakyamuni's experience, and then above all Nichiren Daishonin's experience, and our expectation of being able to experience the same enlightenment. So reciting the sutra, though it's an exercise, is praise. We are praising the wisdom of the Buddhas in teaching life to us. So through reciting, we honor, we praise, and we express gratitude. And Gongyo as a whole, and your discover as we go on going through it, is really a, 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 a ceremony of gratitude. Someone once said, gratitude is an area of life which you have, if you haven't got the key to it, causes you to miss an immense part of the joy and happiness of this world, or words to that effect. Gratitude opens the door to a huge area of life that one never realized before. Gongyo is very much a ceremony of gratitude for life. So, the Lotus Sutra, as you may know, is really an incredible teaching. And it's set, as it were, on a stage which is far beyond the confines of this world or our particular environment here. It really is set on a universal stage. It talks in t 
terms of the universe itself. It expresses things in terms of eons and light years and the eternity of life and the boundlessness of the universe. It's not concerned with time or space. And I believe the more one does gong you, the more you feel that connection with the great universe. You feel, as it were, less and less confined by time and space as we know it. And you feel the ability of your life and its achievements to expand far beyond the bounds of one's earlier imagination. So, of course, since this is concerned with the rhythm of life, that's obviously a very dynamic thing. This rhythm or energy or life force which makes the tides come and go and the seasons change and the earth move round the sun and the winds blow and all this incredibly dynamic force. So, therefore, the rhythm of life is in itself vigorous and vibrant. Therefore, one's recitation of the sutra should also be vigorous and vibrant. It's not supposed to be uh, in a slurred or slow or sort of funeral-like pace. It should, as someone once said, be at the speed of a galloping horse. Of course this takes time. You can't get to that sort of rhythm until you've been practicing for a bit. It doesn't take so long, a matter of a few months. Now really, that practice of gongyo is to vitalize once again your life force for the day. Therefore it should be vibrant. In Buddhism, there is a concept called the three acts of body, mouth, and heart. The three acts of body, mouth and heart. That concerns the practice of Buddhism. So in the case of Gongyo, of course the body is what you place in front of your Gohonsan and start to practice. You are giving during that practice your body to the practice. And then the mouth is of course the words that come from it. Do those words really ring out firmly? If you're giving your mouth to the Buddha, they should be firm and strong and vibrant. I don't mean that they should be shouted, and I don't mean that they should be whispered. I mean they should be firm and clear. And as one chants to the Gonzan, the vibrations from your voice should, as it were, travel out to the Gonsan so that they return back to you and then go on out into the universe. A firm, clear, steady voice. This is giving, the act of giving your mouth. And the act of giving your heart, this, of course, is the most important of all. And that's where gratitude comes in once again. The very effort of doing this gongyo is expressing your gratitude, expressing your faith in what the Buddha taught, because you're actually carrying out what he said you should do. So this gratitude, this desire to do it no matter what, even if one's feeling lousy when you get up, that is really the act of giving your heart. So. In that giving, one should clear one's mind of any slander or hatred or bad feelings about anybody. In the process of reciting the sutra, you'll find in an amazing way that'll happen. Perhaps some of you experience times when some bad thought about somebody may come into your mind and you'll find yourself starting to sneeze or cough or something will stop you and clear that thought from your mind. This is the natural process of purification and the okay, power of God. Enough for the spirit. sutras. Now the silent prayer. There are four silent prayers. In Japanese, the, the silent prayers are called Go Kanenmon. Go, Geo, Kanen, K A N N E N, 
mon, M-O-N, go kanen mon. So go is the honorific prefix, as in gohonzen, the honorable, if you like. And mon means a passage or a sentence, mon, a passage or a sentence. And kanen means concentration of the mind or meditation with a purpose of attaining enlightenment, meaning of kannen. So the purpose of those silent prayers is to concentrate in absolute silence your whole life on whatever it is that particular silent prayer is about. And we'll briefly talk about that in a second. So this is not just reading. Of course you do read the silent prayers. You need to read them to refresh your mind on the words and their meaning. Even though you can do the whole of Gongyo without the prayer book, you should still have it open when you do the silent prayers because it's very difficult to concentrate without taking in each word. But it's not just reading, it's living what you read with your whole life. So, of course, in many religions, the silent prayers are the only practice. But in the case of Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism, the silent prayers are a refreshment, a daily refreshment of your determination. A daily refreshment, first, of your gratitude, for being alive and for the benefits that the practice of bringing you. And then your determination in return to do your own human revolution, to try to clear your life of unhappy karma and in the process make other people in your environment happy. So you're beginning to see now that the reciting of the sutra is an exercise to put your life in balance so that when you come to do the silent prayers, your life is purified and they have the greatest possible effect. To bring up or refresh your whole determination to carve out a better life for yourself and others in the future and to live the life first prayer of Gong Yo, its highest potential. Uh, and forgive me, those of you who know this all too well, but I think we should go through it very briefly. The first prayer concerns the forces of the universe, or the Shoten Zenjin, or Buddhist gods. The myriad forces that are at work in the universe, and can, which can either work with us, protecting us, or ignoring us, depending upon how positive or negative our life state is. So the purpose of the first prayer is to refresh one's gratitude for the protection that one's had up to the present and to determine to practice strongly again in order to continue that protection in the future and in the process, if you like, feed those forces. Those forces that are created by the very rhythm of life in order to produce a valuable and happy world. So through our effort to be in rhythm with them, we are feeding them. If we don't feed them, they can leave us and leave our environment. So that is the purpose of the first prayer. The forces that work in other people to help us. The bank manager who will give you a loan if it's for your happiness, but will not give you a loan if it's for your unhappiness. Hmm? That is a Shotin's engine, a force of the universe working within another person. Of course, there are many different forms of that, all of which are forces uh, outside, beyond this planet, in the universe itself, which have a direct effect on our life here. And the second prayer... Again, its concern is with gratitude, gives the ten virtues of the Dai Gohonzon, the original Gohonzon inscribed by Nichiren Dai Shonin. So this is an expression of gratitude for the power of this Dai Gohonzon working in one's life, 
the benefit of yourself and others. It would be a whole lecture again in itself to tell you or explain all those ten virtues. They're difficult to understand to begin with, but the more you study, the more you practice and get experience of the workings of the nam myoho renge in your life, the more you understand each one of them. Again, concerned with gratitude is a series of thank yous to all the people who have brought you the gohonzon and brought you nam myoho renge who have opened your eyes to the law of life or the ultimate truth, starting with Nichiren Daishonin and going on from there to Nikko, his, uh, who succeeded him, and Nichimoku and all the other high priests who over centuries have protected the law and the teachings down. If you like, when you're doing your nam myoho Kyo at the end of that prayer, the people who brought the Gonzan to you the person who shakabukhed you. And then the third prayer is determination. To work for one's own human revolution, to overcome one's unhappy karma and to elevate one's life state so that you can create a more peaceful world and rid yourself of the destructive elements in life which could otherwise cause unhappiness and chaos. And also, uh, for the whole movement of world peace or Kosen Rufu, that we can teach others so that they in turn can do their human revolution. Then the fourth prayer, we remember the people who have died and who had some particular connection with us. But this is very important. We send concentrated prayer and daimoku to those who are deceased, especially family, who have a very close life link to us. Through that, we keep the life link between us and them open and we purify it every time we do it. And our prayer and daimoku for them helps to project them on through the state of death to a new life and indeed can elevate their life state. So those are the prayers, all too briefly. Um, but as you can see, each one has tremendous meaning. And then finally, having done those four prayers in the morning or three of them in the evening, you start to chant Daimoku. So perhaps someone's already thinking, why is it only four in the morning and three in the evening? Uh, the answer to that is that uh, the first prayer, which is for the Buddhist gods, the protective forces, should be at the dawn of the day. I'm afraid some of us don't always get up at the dawn of the day, but that is the reason behind it. As the sun rises and the forces of the universe begin to work through another day, so we should put our life into rhythm with them. Also, perhaps, uh, in the evening time, we are already been through a day, we've already done morning gongyo. Therefore, uh, the practice no need to be quite so assiduous so, daimoku, as it is. I've already mentioned the, the three acts of body, mouth and heart. Of course, these apply to chanting nam myoho renge kyo It should be firm and clear and resonant to be really effective. Kyo of nam myoho renge kyo is sound or communication. If I was talking to a little voice like this, I'd have very little impact on what, you know, your ears really, wouldn't I? Hmm? On the other hand, if I was shouting like this, you'd get fed up to the back teeth in no time. So it should be firm and clear. Firm, a firm voice can be quite... No need to have enormous volume. It should be very firm and concise. And it should hit the gongs and then come back to you. So you don't chant Daimoku to the leader. You chant Daimoku or you recite the Sutra to the Gohons. Your connection direct with the Gohons. So in your Daimoku, as you say the words nam myoho renge kyo which is, remember, the essence of life and the rhythm of the universe, you are then expressing your prayers, your wishes. So those prayers and wishes are going out in 
absolute balance and rhythm with the universal force of life itself and going back into you also in that same rhythm of your life in its best possible state. So this is why they have such a powerful effect. So in the guidance on prayer, of course the way you pray is up to you, but it's been pointed out both by Nichiren Daishonin and by those who have followed him that first and foremost you should pray for the weak points in one's own life, the things that you want to change in order to become a stronger and more valuable and therefore happier person. And then you should pray for Kosen Rufu, that is to say prayers not for yourself but others. And strictly speaking, all prayers for Kosen Rufu, for the happiness of others, for the peace of the world, for the growth of the number of people who meet the Gohonzon and so on, these are all prayers for Kosen Rufu. And they will bring you, strictly speaking, everything that you need for your happiness. But being human, we can't help but sometimes concentrate our mind on our own personal difficulties or obstacles. And this is quite reasonable to do so. But it shouldn't absorb one's whole mind. Many times recently I have felt I had to point this out. People become too absorbed with their own particular problem, their own particular difficulty. But like all things, if you become absorbed by it, then it becomes magnified in your mind and seems impossible to overcome. But if you're really practicing as the Buddha taught, that is to say, practice for yourself and practice for others, then your problem, whatever it may be, will take its right shape and size in your mind and you'll find it remarkably easy to overcome. Now this is an important point. We practice jigyo and keta in Japanese words. This Buddhism is practice for yourself and practice for others. If you neglect others and become absorbed with yourself, you'll get a form of indigestion or stagnation because your problem will become vast in your mind. Whereas in fact, it's really only that size in relation to the power of the gods. So this is a very important point in the balance of the practice. How much should one chant? There is no real answer to that. Nichiren Daishonin said several things about it. First, as I said at the beginning, he said, chant to your heart's content. So what is one's heart's content? It's chanting until you feel, really I've chanted enough about that. So now I'll stop, or perhaps you feel you want to go on and chant about something else. But it's a feeling in your own life. Have I chanted enough about this, honestly? Yes, you have. Okay, that's enough. Or, no, you haven't. Okay, I'll go on for another five minutes or ten minutes or whatever. Chanting to your heart's content. And the second point he said was that there are times when one daimoku, meaning one nam myoho renge kyo, is enough. And yet, there are times when 10,000 is not enough. In other words, it depends on so many things. Your state of life when you began to chant, if you were chanting without doing gongyo, the hugeness of the problem or the depths of the particular aspect of karma that you want to change, so many different factors. Each one of us is different. President Keita once said, there's absolutely no point whatsoever in one person telling another how much Daimoku he chants or she chants. How much you should chant is quite different to how much you should chant. But speaking as a general sort of guideline, it's always been said that really if you take an average person, you need to chant about 3,000 daimoku a day. That is a steady flow every day of about 45 minutes to one hour's daimoku. That is ideal. 
if you can keep that going consistently year in year out that's much better than doing 10 minutes one day nothing the next day and 10 hours at the weekend that isn't a steady rhythm Nichiren Daishonin said practice should be like flowing water so that steady rhythm of practice is the most important thing of all for all the reasons that I've been talking about ever since I began to speak this afternoon or this evening so there is no rule how much Daimaka we should chant we should chant to our hearts content in other words as we chant and we feel oh I'm going to think I'm going to stop now you should say in your mind have I chanted enough and listen to what your wisdom tells you because your wisdom is really flowing at that time and furthermore you should chant until you feel joy rising up in your life there's no point in stopping chanting Daimoku in the middle of struggling with some problem that's worrying you when you've given your problem or whatever it is to your prayers to your Daimoku and to the Gonzan then go on a bit longer just listening to your voice chanting the Buddha's life or the Buddha's wisdom of nam myoho kyo over and over again to the Gonzan with your mind just on the words and on the gonzen, or if you haven't got a gonzen yet, to the sound, then really you'll find joy rising up in your life. But if you stop in the middle of still worrying about some problem, of course you won't. You've got to give your problems to your prayers, to your daimoku. And then before you finally stop, just go on a little bit longer. Maybe it's only two or three minutes and you'll feel so different at the end of it. Chant until you feel joy rising up in your life. So really the Daimoku, as you can see, is the final, if you like, triumphant act of an amazing ceremony which the more you do it, the more you feel its significance in your life. In the Gosho Nichiren Daishonin said, when you bow to the mirror, the image in the mirror bows to you. The mirror he's referring to is the Gonzo. The mirror which reflects your Buddha state. When you bow to the mirror, the image in the mirror bows to you. The Buddha state in your life will be working with you through the mirror of the Buddha state inscribed on the Gohan. So this practice of Gongyo affects you yourself, activating the Buddha state, making your wisdom and compassion flow. And at the same time, through Kyo of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, it goes out to your environment and affects the Buddha state in every single thing in your entire environment and beyond even to the whole universe. So of course, it's difficult to believe, but more and more you do it, you prove it. So our attitude in Gongyo should be strong and vigorous and upright. We have to make effort from the moment we begin. Our whole life state will, be, will reflect the way we do Gongyo. Of course, if you miss Gongyo one morning, don't feel guilty. Okay, I missed it. I'll do a greater one tomorrow morning. Or, if you find yourself getting into the habit of missing Gongyo, then I recommend you make up your mind to do it wherever you can, at some point during the day. But above all, don't feel guilty about it. You've missed it. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't bring that time back. So, take it in your stride and determine to do a better one the next day. Or, as I say, if it's becoming a habit, then make up your mind you're going to do it anywhere, somewhere, during the day. So, at one time during my practice, I found myself going through such a period. For months and months I was battling with it, to change this aspect of my karma that was making it difficult for me to get up in time in the morning. And I was doing gongyo in car parks and offices and even once or twice in the loo and so on. 
that I was determined to bust this karma that was making me so unhappy. And it did. Through that cause of making effort to do it, in the end my life stabilized and I changed that thing in my life which was causing me so much disruption and unhappiness. So I think I've said enough. I don't want to say more, otherwise you'll get confused. But I'll just end with one more quotation from the Gosha, from a Gosha called Honin Myosho. And it says this, The common mortal himself is the Buddha when he devotes his life to Namyo Horenge Kyo by chanting with strong faith. He attains enlightenment or Buddhahood in this world without discarding his life as a common mortal. The purpose of the practice of Gongya, as instructed or taught by the Buddha of this age, Nichiren Daishonin, is to achieve Buddhahood, exactly as he says in this line, without discarding our lives as a common mortal. Thanks very much I indeed for listening. That, that, Many thanks. That if you're on your own, yes, I think it is good to stop, go back and go over it again. I don't mean go over the whole thing again, but just that bit that you know you mispronounced. But obviously if you're with other people, that's difficult. But any, the ultimate aim, of course, is to get yourself to do it word perfect. I mean, mm, okay. yes, you should be precise. I mean, it's quite true that you hear people not being precise. <laughs> but you should be precise. I mean, nam myo ho renge kyo should be very clear. Even though it's fast, it should be clear. Because that, you know, is the essence of life. If you want to put yourself to make use of that, to express your own life as nam myo ho renge kyo, you know, it must be clear and precise, mustn't it? Otherwise it becomes slovenly or lazy or whatever or slack. Hmm? So it should be clear. It's quite true, when you hear a lot of people chanting together, it sounds like a blur, but actually it's probably not so. It's merely because there's a small difference, you know, a, a moment's difference between everyone's voice. Hmm. Well, but in fact, well, I think it, you, can de you can detect that, really. You, you become very perceptive about yourself through doing gongya. I mean, if if you are, you do become absorbed with the beauty of your own voice, <laughs> it, so, some, something is going to say to you, hey, you know, you're becoming absorbed with yourself and you've forgotten completely about nam myo and the Gohonsun and so on. You, you'll find, you know, it, something will correct you. Mm, that's right. <laughs> but one's... One's voice should, as far as, far as and obviously you want your voice to sound good, it, going by that act of body, mouth and heart, you know, you, obviously if you're giving your voice to the Buddha or to the highest state of life, it should be as nice as you could make it, but I mean, some, we oh, all have different really sorts good, Yeah, of it's voice. a good question though. Uh, thank you for asking, I really meant to mention it. Um, People get worried sometimes because their mind wanders, especially when they're reciting the sutra. That doesn't matter when you're reciting the sutra. The sutra is an exercise. Therefore, if your mind wanders, it doesn't, strictly speaking, matter. Though, of course, quite naturally, naturally you wish to concentrate more and more with your mind on the words or on the meaning of the sutra or on the gohonzon. That, that is something that grows in you. But it's not prayer. It's an exercise, so it doesn't matter so much. But it does matter a lot in the silent prayers. The silent prayers, you're concentrating your whole life in a particular act of expressing gratitude or determination or whatever. So if your mind wanders there, of course, whatever it wanders to becomes the meaning of that prayer, doesn't it? So, I mean, if, you know, you're concentrating on your determination uh, to teach others, say, about Buddhism, and your mind's wandering off, you know, onto, uh, I don't know, your breakfast or bacon and eggs or something or other, then your prayer's about bacon and eggs. 
So it does matter in the silent prayers. And in Daimoku, uh, you, in any case, the power of Daimoku is so great when you're doing it that you will find that you wish to concentrate your mind. The, the Daimoku is bringing with it so much life force and wisdom and compassion that you'll be very perceptive if your mind, you know, just goes off and becomes a sort of bit of cotton wool. And you'll want to bring it back onto whatever it is you need. In other words, you won't want to waste that daimoku. No, well, both, both of them it for you. Thanks very much. The, Ho the Hoben chapter, which is theory, the theory of life and the existence of Buddha's state in it, we're, expe we're expressing our praise or gratitude for the wisdom of the Buddhas in explaining that, and also our expectancy that we can bring out the Buddha state in our own life. And the Jorio chapter is Shakyamuni's own experience of Buddhahood. So in that case, we are again praising his experience and, and Nichiren Daishonin's experience of Buddhahood, which enabled him to create the Gohonzon, in the expectation, of course, of becoming or attaining Buddhahood ourselves.